Hi, all. Hope you're enjoying Bay Area Book Fair. Have you been to Lacuna? Do you have books? 50,000 books as sculptor, free for the taking? Anyway, I think they'll be gone by the end of the day. My name is Jane Chabatori. I'm a member of the board of the National Book Critics Circle and of the steer program steering committee of the Bay Area Book Festival. It's my great honor to um, introduce this morning's 10 o'clock. Welcome to the conversation about income inequality and the power of storytelling. We have with us today award-winning cultural critic Rebecca Solnit, who published an essay defining the moment when San Francisco and the world turned on Silicon Valley as rep represented by Google buses. And from the East Coast, New York City, acclaimed author and critic John Freeman, who edited Tale of Two Cities, a collection of essays contrasting the lives of New York City's haves and have-nots, including Freeman's own homeless brother. I'm gonna give you intros, and then they're gonna have at their conversation. Um, writer, historian, and activist Rebecca Solnit is the author of 18 books about environment, landscape, community, art, politics, hope, and feminism including atlases of San Francisco and New Orleans with New York forthcoming in October, so watch for that one. She's also written the books Men Explain Things to Me, The Far Away Nearby, A Paradise Built in Hell, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, Wanderlust, A History of Walking, and River of Shadows, Edward Mybridge and the Technological Wild West, for which she received a Guggenheim, the National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism, and the Lannan Literary Award. A product of the California public education system from kindergarten to graduate school, she's a columnist at Harper's. I don't know if you've seen her piece about prison and Alcatraz and, and kayaking, but if you haven't, it's really important. John Freeman is the editor of Freeman's, a literary biennial which features writing by Louise Erdrich, Lydia Davis, and Hiroki Murakami, among others. He's written two books of nonfiction, The Tyranny of Email and How to Read a Novelist, along with a collection of poems, Maps, which is coming next year from Copper Canyon. Also a child of California public schools, he lives today in New York City, where he is writer in residence at NYU and executive editor at Lit Hub. In 2014, he edited Tale of Two Cities, an anthology about inequality in New York today. His work has been translated into more than 20 languages. His new publication, Freeman's, will be the subject of a discussion he and I have this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Thank you. And on with our conversation. It's so exciting to play at the freight when you're tone deaf and can't sing or play an instrument. <laughs> We're just going to ask you to beatbox. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're um, looking well, for things that rhyme with theory. Um, eerie. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> um, no slide guitar. No. Uh, well, good morning. Um, thank you for coming. Um, thank you. A big thank you to Cheryl Lynn and Melissa and everyone at the Book Festival for creating uh, this enlarged public space uh, for discussions not just about books, but about ideas and the place we live in and what we care about and what we value and what we feel challenges those values. Um, it feels, feels especially appropriate that we're having this discussion on a Sunday morning, uh, for, because for me, no one's work over the last 20 years has enlarged my sense of um, possibilities and the problems that need to be addressed, um, and also the sense of the spirit level to some degree, which I'll ask you later than Rebecca Solnit. Um, and it is a big privilege to be in your hometown. Um, well, San Francisco. You come over after. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I think you're, you're, I give you an expanded radius of Thank you. Um, most of the Definitely the Bay Area. <laughs> I'll take it. But let's, you know, before we get to inequality in cities, I just want to pretty much start there. Um, you, you have this beautiful line, and, and if you haven't read this book, Savage Dreams, this is kind of the river from which all the tributaries in her work begins. This, this line that says, places teach us um, if, if we listen. And I wonder, you know, you've, we're going to get to San Francisco and the Bay Area and Berkeley later, but you've, you've lived many other places, and I wonder if you could just list a few of them and what they, what they taught you or what they whispered to you. Well, before I was five years old, I was actually born in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Then we lived for two years in New Mexico and Santa Fe. 
Then we lived in Lima, Peru for a year, and then Cincinnati before we got to Novato, the cop town in Marin I grew up in. And, um, but then I've mostly been here. I've spent a lot of time in New Mexico, Nevada, and the Mojave since, and um, in my beloved deserts. And then I kind of ran away to Paris when I was 17 and spent uh, about a year there. And that's it. I'm, I'm, you know, maybe not provincial, but very local. But those are, those are the places. Uh, you have this, another great line in here, which describes the Bible as the least illustrative um, travel book ever. Because right? <laughs> it's just a list of places and, and nothing about them. But pick one place from that list that you just gave me, Paris, Lima, um, Cincinnati, Novato. And what, you know, what did it teach you while you were there? Well, Novato's the place before, other than San Francisco, I've spent the most time in my life. I was there from age just before I turned five. This month I've been in California 50 years to um, when I, you know, till about 15. And it was, it was a kind of an amazing place in that it was an incredibly beautiful landscape. There was a quarter horse stud farm on the other side of the backyard fence, and the west began right there. And it was also a really narrow-minded, intolerant place that... Uh, with a fantastic public library and great public librarians. And so my two refuges from um, my not so great family life and et cetera, where it's the public library and the open space and basically nothing's changed, except that better family. <laughs> did you think of it as the West when you were there? In a way I did. And one of the things about, is this too loud? Should I push it further away? Okay, I'll keep it right where it is. One of the things about growing up out here when I did, I'm older than, a, well, although there's a lot of great, I'm younger than a lot of you, I can tell. <laughs> all, you who, all you whose heads shine so beautifully in the dark, but, uh, but I'm older too, is when I was growing up out here, you were told that civilization had, and you, you grew up in Sacramento, you know, that civilization had happened elsewhere. I, and we were taught almost nothing in, in fourth grade for California history, we went from, and then, then it went dead. No, it's there. At, uh, from kind of wilderness to shopping mall in a single bound, the native people, the 99 language groups with their amazing creativity and diversity were dismissed as diggers. So there's a real sense that history was elsewhere, culture was elsewhere. You were in a kind of colonial outpost of New York and Europe. And it's really other Californians like Gary Snyder who really helped me overcome that and just digging into the history myself and writing histories I feel like I should have been able to read, including Savage Dreams and the book before that, uh, The Secret Exhibition. Did, was it Turtle Island that um, turned you on? And it was the, the whole gestalt of Gary Snyder. And one of, it's funny because there's this period where, and I, I said this about a dozen years ago at Moe's, that somebody compared me to Susan Sontag once, which made my publishers very happy, so they beat the, the hell out of that quote. And, you know, I love Susan Sontag. I like it that a Jewish girl raised in Tucson, Arizona, went on to kind of conquer the world. But she was a very Eurocentric person who moved to New York as soon as she could and spent a lot of... So, and I remember just thinking at the time, it's like, well, I'm not really like Susan Sontag because... It's like, well, what's my justification? It's like, because I'm like Gary Snyder. <laughs> and I actually come between them in the alphabet when, we, when poetry and nonfiction get shelved together. It's Snyder, Solnit, Sontag. And um, it's, it's always nice to know. If you write books, where you go in the alphabet is always an interesting thing. Oh my god, Mona, how exciting to see you. Great Egyptian feminist in the front row. Shh. <laughs> so we must hang out. So, um, you know, so Gary really did a remarkable job of saying, I'm not going to be a, you know, a kind of unloved stepchild of Europe. And he really looked towards indigenous uh, native culture and towards Buddhism and Asia for all, a kind of counter narrative that I think has really formulated post war culture on the West Coast, where we have huge Asian populations. You know, we are Pacific, not Atlantic. We're blessedly far from Europe and that sort of template it's given a lot more Eastern people. And indigenous presence uh, is still really strong, very resurgent since the quincentennial. And th those have been huge influences on me. Mm. So thank you, Gary. Uh, to draw a line back to Sontag, but moving forward, um, is one thing that Sontag did do well is, is write about the overlooked and the obscured uh, literature from around the world that was often not translated or brought to this country. 
Yeah, and absolutely. I love her and respect her work and feel like she really kind of opened up space for a uh, woman and, uh, who came after and sort of left cultural criticism and a kind of very political criticism in a new way. But there's also, you know, that sense of abandonment of the West. I met her a few times just before her final illness. And she started to get nostalgic about Tucson and the West. And I always feel like if I'd met her a few years earlier, there would have been some amazing conversations about the way those places shaped her, a sense of kind of wide openness that stayed with her in the East. Well, the one thing I see about your work is it's not just looking at culturally overlooked texts or films or photographs, but it's looking at overlooked cultures, uh, the often overlooked history of the West. And I wonder if you could speak about where that emerged from in you, um, if it was Snyder that kicked it off or if there are other things. And it really, you know, my, my writing, my first book was about a group of artists around Wallace Berman. How many of you have heard of Wallace Berman? Thank you, dozen. <laughs> and uh, I, I worked at SF MoMA when I was in grad school here at Berkeley, and um, they had an amazing work by Berman on the wall. I was like 21 when I saw it. And I was like this dumb kid who thought, oh, important work of art by important artist, I'll go look for the book on him. And he had sort of chosen to live underground and was part of a group of people who had chosen not to go east, not to go to the New York City art world that was so much more dominant. There wasn't really, uh, oh my God, I see Malcolm too. This is so great. If Malcolm and Mona meet each other, the world will be a better place. <laughs> but um, I see genius lurking in the dark. But... Um, you know, it was about these, so I just got curious, and then I ended up, you know, he was this Jewish guy raised in L.A. who did this very remarkable artwork, so completely independent of abstract expressionism and the dominant culture of the era, and but also understood that the job, and this is perfect seeing Malcolm walk in, Malcolm Margolin of Heyday Press, one of the great figures of our... <laughs> So Berman realized that the job was not just to make individual works of art that were his expression, but to make a cultural space in which other people could make art in a way that was not that easy on the West Coast. And so I started, you know, and so just sort of, I interviewed them all, that was my thesis, except Berman, who was a dead man who'd never given an interview, so I got to piece it together by talking to everybody else, and realized that there was a major cultural movement out here that nobody was telling us about. And I've really been off and running you know, that was the beginning of kind of tracking alternate histories is that if you got away from the kind of, you know, New York centrism, there were all these other narratives and stories. And then the next book, Savage Dreams, that you said such nice things about, was about the nuclear wars and the Indian wars, also kind of untold stories. And it's one of the great things about being out here is that we were so long treated as a place that had no history that, and we have so much that it hasn't been... It has not been exhausted. You know, you, and it's sad. I go to the San Francisco Public Library and there's like an entire case of books, you know, like, a, like 10 shelves like this on the Civil War. And then the war against Mexico, by which we stole their northern half, gets like seven books. And uh, there's, there's not that, you know, there's a lot of history and not that that happened, not that much was written. So it's, it's been great being, and it kind of orients you. If you stay out here, you're already kind of in opposition to that dominant narrative that nothing happened here and, you know, and that the history of the United States is the Revolutionary War and the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, but not Cesar Chavez and Alcatraz and et cetera. Mm. One thing that uh, sustains me by reading your work is that you, while you're pointing out things we need to be active about and, and care about and protest, you never uh, give in to total doom. And, 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 and that's too easy. <laughs> but there is a kind of voluptuousness to doom, right? Yeah, you know, when I wrote Hope in the Dark and went on the road, and it was interesting who I got uh, attacked by. And it was often comfortable middle class white people who were deeply attached to their despair. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I have some stock phrases that arose from those five years, one of which is that my mission was to steal the t teddy bear of despair from the loving arms of the left. <laughs> and the, the other, <laughs> which I'm still doing to the best of my ability. And the other was that despair is a leather jacket in which everyone looks good. And 
hope, hope is a... F- Hope is a frilly pink dress. I, here I am in black, but secretly I'm wearing this frilly pink dress very few people want to wear because you expose your, knee, your knees and other things in it. And despair, you know, and it's interesting how much we conduct our conversations like wars, and despair is a kind of one-upsmanship. Nobody, hardly anybody ever gets faulted for saying it's worse than you think, it's so bad, everything sucks, we always lose, it'll never work. <laughs> But if you, and it's funny because they're actually proven wrong all the time, partly because things like Black Lives Matter and the Arab Spring and Occupy that nobody anticipated spring up, but also because a lot, act, you know, a lot of organizing and activism and campaigns work, things change. Mm. And, um, you know, and so you'll get faulted, you'll get attacked for saying like, well, maybe, you know, maybe we'll have a black president. Maybe, you know, maybe women will get the vote by 1920. It only took us 80 years. And, you know, maybe at, uh, you know, and there's been a lot of remarkable change in my lifetime, and you have to know history to know just how sucky it was to be anyone but a, a straight white Christian male in this country until about f- 15 minutes ago. <laughs> and um, nothing, nothing against your kind. Some of you are great allies. But, um, so yeah, and despair, but the other thing is despair is kind of a luxury. I, I see people like the coalition of Amokli workers, these incredible farm workers who are organizing beautifully out of Amokli, Florida, mostly undocumented immigrants. And like despair would mean like, yeah, we're gonna live in slavery, we're gonna starve, our children are gonna starve, we're going to suffer hideous abuse, we're gonna, you know, and it's like upper middle class people, despair means you're gonna eat Doritos and ice cream while watching Breaking Bad, the complete set. You know, you're not, you're not going to be imprisoned and tortured and starve and watch your children be destroyed and your whole world be taken away from them. So despair becomes a kind of privilege. And, you know, a lot of privileges are corrosive and, you know, I'm corrosive enough without indulging in that one. <laughs> I guess what I'm, what I'm steering towards is that uh, I think we can all in this room assume that, that there's a necessity to bear witness to suffering. That suffering without witness is yes. is, is the, the most abject form of of despair. Um, but what I see in your work is that um, resistance needs to be borne witness to. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's one other thing. I grew up sort of inside the left in the Bay Area with a family that was had a bunch of progressives in it. And I think a lot of people come out of the mainstream saying there's a dark underbelly nobody talks about, and they make that their vocation. And that's important to do, but it needs to be, you know, it's not only that the media is not reporting on how corrupt the mainstream is, they're not reporting on how extraordinary the alternatives are, how many victories, how many kind of um, prefigurative uh, uh, communities and uh, idealistic things are happening, how many victories we've already achieved, how many lives are being led and communities organized as victories now. And, that's exa- you're exactly right. That needs witnessing too, and that's the story that gets told us. Mm. In this book, you point out that the war um, that Henry David Thoreau is often forgotten when he went to the woods that he was protesting the war in Mexico. Yeah. And that civil disobedience in this country, the notion of it, begins with imperialism. It's imperialism and slavery. He was protesting both with his refusal to pay taxes. There's also and it's interesting. I've written elsewhere about the tendency to try and fish in Henry David Thoreau into two different people, are, you know, the sort of token civil disobedient and the writer of cute little nature extracts. Um, <laughs> I and, didn't know that work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can take all these nice pretty passages out of Thoreau and kind of denature them like tissue for transplant, and, um, and people do. And it's interesting, people also see, and I've written a lot about this because it makes me crazy, I did a piece one of the most fun pieces I wrote in the last few years was about getting to the bottom of the question of who did Henry David Thoreau's laundry. And secret tip, nobody actually knows, but there was all this framework that his mother did it. And it was like, you know, he went, pretended to be a hermit but he, in the woods, but he brought his laundry home. It's like, and it's like, fuck that stupid storyline. He never pretended any such thing. The, the, you know, the hut in the, in, on Emerson's Timberland was an experimental laboratory for investigating economics and ideas and getting some writing done because he did so much work when he was at home and helped so many other people. And um, you know, and those woods were amazing. Runaway slaves were coming through those woods. You know, it was, and it's, we were talking before we came on about 
there's a certain sector in our culture that likes to think there are spaces that are apolitical. And people think he was A, running away, B, to a place that was apolitical. And he was running towards a different kind of deep engagement with politics. And the Concord lady, Female Anti-Slavery Society had its meetings in some of them in that cabin. How political, you know, this kind of amazing group of his mother, aunt, and sisters who politicized uh, him and Emerson into these great voices against slavery. You know, this, um, it was ladies, so it's sort of a forgotten chapter. And then this, like, runaway slaves coming through the woods, traces of Native people who had been forced to disappear through genocide and land theft in those woods. Like, how, how much more political can a space get than that? So I always want, you know, I want us to see Thoreau whole and undivided and in, in full power. And he's really such a touchstone figure for me. Mm. You have this... Um... Wonderful way you've characterized it yourself as sort of combining reportage, the lyric uh, Im impulses of almost poetry, um, and the associative logic of, of the essay. And I see some of that um, in I mean, Mike Davis, who you've written about and spoken about as a mentor and an inspiration. But I also see uh, uh, Calvino and other writers in there. I wonder if you could talk about the writers that were important to you in developing um, a, a mechanism that allowed you to wander the way that you do, both on, on, in life and on the page? And there's two answers to that. I'll name the writer second, because I, in one version of the introduction to Savage Dreams, I'm not sure it's in this one, I talk about how the Nevada test site where we set off more than 1,000 nuclear bombs is actually what taught me to write the way I do. I was, you know, there's so much desire to separate and segregate in a society, whether it's genders or orientations or people or classes or work and uh, life or et cetera. And kinds of writing also, I was writing little lapidary lyrical essays that were very kind of tight and contained and, and had political overtones, but they were very separate from the journalism I'd been trained to do at my lovely alma mater, the J School. I'm probably, am I pointing in the right direction, right up there? <laughs> Is that the right direction? Okay. <laughs> East of here. At, um, and, uh, and then I was doing work as an art critic, and there's a real sort of uh, seduction of the authoritative, impersonal voice of criticism and et cetera that postmodernism really helped me get over. But I went to the Nevada test site, and it was this place where all these stories converge. I was having these very intense kind of aesthetic and physical and social experiences as an activist, and watching this sunset while your hands are cuffed behind you because you're trying to prevent Armageddon in an already radioactive landscape, native people claim is that you know, uh, you know that Quakers and Mormons and physicists and uh, uh, atomic survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and a lot of other people are converging. At, that required every possible way I'd learn how to write to kind of articulate all the complexities, and so I had this revelation trying to describe what I was experiencing and encountering there that these three separate styles were not separate except by some rules I could immediately begin to disregard, and that developed my style. I know, and there were the writers who were influences. I knew, you know, I'd always intended to be a writer as soon as I learned how to read, and, um, you know, when I was six, and then um, it took a long time to realize it wasn't going to be fiction, which is kind of the great valorized, you know, it's the king on the throne in literature in the U.S., and has been for a century or so. It's interesting to go back to like Jane Austen's time where the novel is a kind of denigrated side form and other kinds of prose and poetry are considered far more elevated. And, um, so, you know, in my teens, I started gathering models and the one great, the kind of the greatest shock to my system was when I bought Borges, uh, Jorge Luis Borges' Labyrinths when I was 15. I still have the broken spine, like 50 pence penguin uh, copy. And just to see that without going into kind of the conventions, and they're not necessarily nonfiction, but they're certainly not fiction in the sense of short stories. And um, just seeing that in the sort of compass of an essay, you could be that lyrical and imaginative, creative and bold, was, and those pieces were revelations to me. And. Uh, you know, and then came Virginia Woolf and George Orwell, who were big early on, and Pauline Kael, who was still writing film reviews in The New Yorker, my homegirl from Petaluma. <laughs> and, um, 
you know, was, was a big influence. I read a lot of reviews and things like that, but, and I was sort of muddling my way forward. But the test site was really the catalyst that, you know, as described in this book. When you were living in Paris and when you returned, um, were you arrested by inequality, uh, the, the visible symptoms of inequality? You know, it's interesting, and those of us who are older, and um, so, how many of you were born after 1980? Okay, small percentage. And the, you know, the interesting thing, when I lived in Paris, there were clochards, which is kind of like our skid row bombs, to use sort of derogatory, but then popular language. It was a very small hardcore of homeless men, usually men, usually alcoholic, who, who begged and could be seen drunk in public, et cetera. But we didn't have the economic inequality like that. And I, I'm old enough, I remember when people do, were not burdened by housing debt, medical debt, and educational debt the way are, they are now, where, where, edu, you know, where there are a lot more financial aid packages, student loans weren't sort of deregulated and predatory the way they are, the for-profit college industry didn't exist, et cetera. And housing was not, you know, I moved to, I lived in a single room occupancy residential hotel for $140 a month my first several months in San Francisco. Then I moved into a $200 a month apartment I kept for 25 years. It was $400 a month by the time I moved out in 19, uh, in 2006, which is, which is what allowed me to. Why, why did you move out? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I sometimes regret it. I, I, had a, I had a pretty evil landlady who was very angry, even though she was making huge amounts of money off the building as a whole. And landlords in the Bay Area feel that they have a divine right, like the 11th commandment is, I shall maximize my real estate investment. And um, so, you know, I got a chance to buy something, and um, I needed more space. My books were taking over, and like there was, and it was a studio, a small, a, gloriously sunlit but small studio apartment. I'd a kind of outgrown, and uh, so it's time to move on. And it's thrilling not having landlords, um, even if I have to pay for my own, well, I was sort of paying for my own plumbing problems then anyway, and uh, floor refinishing, et cetera. But, um, and that really, subs you know, that subsidized my creative life. I really have great respect for how much more difficult it is for people. If I'd been born 20 years later, I don't know what my trajectory would have looked like. Cheap rent, uh, cheap education with very little debt, et cetera, were a huge asset to me. And, and economic inequality, and there's some that the Clintons did some, de and, and Prop 13 here in the late 70s, and then Reagan in power nationally, and then a bit of Clinton, and then a lot of Bush. You know, we've been deregulating and pushing economic uh, inequality for most of my adult lifetime. And it's really, I, you know, you were mentioning seeing uh, the homeless people in Berkeley, and we really live in what would have been considered a really bleak and grotesque third world country if people in the 1970s had seen the way we live. And San Francisco, with its newly minted billionaires coming up with new and stupid ways to celebrate excess and exploit uh, their, uh, their, whether it's exploiting uh, homes and communities with Airbnb or drivers with Uber, which just came up with this incredibly grotesque predatory lending scheme to get poor people to sign up for cars they can't afford to work for Uber or what. You know, I'm, it's part of what's gross t grotesque about living here. We live in the, one of the engines driving the ec economic inequality. So living in a city with you know, a big homeless population. 71% of the homeless in San Francisco were formerly housed there. They're, the myth that they're all mentally ill people who drift in from elsewhere is a myth. And, uh, and, you know, and it's funny, we don't talk about it nearly enough, and it's partly the lack of historical memory that the whole UC system used to be completely free to every Californian, the best educational system in the world, and it could be again. We could live in a world, and that's a lot of what why I think hope is always rooted in history is that we could be in a world that could be extraordinarily different and that has been extraordinarily different in some respects. And people don't remember that, you know, one person working 40 hours a week, not 50, not 60, not two jobs, not two partners working two jobs, used to be able to support a family in style and just not be terrified by debt uh, the way that people are. And it's, I think it's a lack of good journalism, the lack of good storytelling, of inter 
generational memory is part of why people accommodate to things that, you know, they adjust to things that we should resist and not adjust to. And I, that's a big part of how I feel about economic inequality now. And it's also something where it really has a cultural impact. You see, like, one of the things people talk about a lot, New York City, one of the most expensive cities in the world, has all these unpaid internships. And if your affluent mom and dad love and want to support you after college, you can have an internship like that. If you're a poor kid on your own, you know, um, that's not, you know, you can't, you can't do that unless you go even further into debt. People have to make really, you know, the freedom I had because I was paying $200 a month rent, which even as like a teenage waitress I could cover and have a bit of time on the side, um, you know, and then making my tiny pittance of a living as a freelance writer with some um, office temp work on the side at first, you know, and, uh, mm. you know, circumstances are really different and it has a big impact on, right, on young writers and not so young writers too. And it's something I think we need to talk about as part of who gets to make culture, have we, who, you know, is it becoming more and more privileged? James Baldwin was a waiter uh, when he st first started to write. Are these map, um, these atlases that you're making, are they an attempt in any way to slow the, 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 the demolition of memory down so that we can reimagine um, what's there and, and also what, what we're about to leave behind in terms of and more enriching ways of, of being a civil society, a civil city. Yeah, an Atlas trilogy is as much about the present and the future as the past, so it's geography, culture, ecology, as well as history, but it is trying to give people a deeper sense of the city as a place of infinite coexistences and infinite diversity, and, um, you know, and of, of inexhaustible stories of which your own is only one, you know, and maps can hold, you know, there, uh, I know a map can hold many stories in a way, you know, rather than one narrative, and it's something that really interests me about them, and they may not be complete, the fragments are there, and your imagination fleshes them out and explores them. But yeah, but giving people a deeper sense of what cities are, because cities also, you know, we're in a, I'm part of the new economic inequality, different than the old economic inequality, is that part of what shaped post-war post America was white flight to the suburbs subsidized by freeway building and um, homeowners tax deductions and et cetera. And, um, and that really left the cities to poor people, immigrants, non-white people, and weird people. Um, bless us all. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> You know, and white and uh, middle class white people rediscovered cities uh, a while back, and they're basically taking them back. And it's one of the shocking things. San Francisco, I when the uh, Jessica Williams, a uh, black woman, was shot to death by the San Francisco police a couple two weeks ago Thursday. Um, I went to the memorial that night, and people held a banner that said, we are the last 3%, that San Francisco is down to 3% African American. And when you push people, and it was about, 14 or 17 percent in the 70s, and uh, and its economics have done a lot of the pushing out, and people move to the outskirts where they don't. And there's a lot of great things about being in the center, you know, that urban density is a political density and political possibility. You're visible, you you have representation and presence in a way you don't. And like a lot of people have moved out to Antioch, a lot of black people. And stuff, and so there's kind of flipping where uh, the Paris model, where rich people get the city center, and the suburbs become the kind of banlieu slums, is I don't know what it's going to do to us. But remembering what cities can be, which is this powerful engine of subversion, you know, they're the centers have been the centers of capital. Although it's interesting in the Bay Area, seeing people like Chevron move to the suburbs because they don't get protested there and blockaded there as much, for one thing. It's really inconvenient going to blockade there now. And, um, but not impossible, as uh, some of you know. So those geographies, that's part of the geography, of, not only of inequality in the pure form, but of kind of a geography that corresponds to inequality that, that, that I'm interested in with Atlas, is what happens when these populations move around, and what have cities, what have cities been for us? How have they been culturally and politically generative. I think that's where most political revolutions have come from since the French Revolution. And you do have guerrillas in the forests in Nicaragua and Cuba and things like that, but still, you know, 
I think cities matter, mm. and this has been trying to describe what they are and why. And you, you say trilogy because after San Francisco, you made one with, uh, about New Orleans, and there's one yeah. coming in the fall about yeah. New York City. And then it'll be finished, and I will never make another atlas because there's a truly insane amount of work <laughs> and organizing and fundraising and herding cats. And the really exciting thing is, though, I will have realized one of my life ambitions. Not only will I have a trilogy, but UC Press is bringing it out as a box set next year. So it'll be just like Lord of the Rings, a trilogy in a box. <laughs> <laughs> no hobbits. <laughs> but it, it seems like one thing I've noticed Some through the books is, the, the, is that music is becoming a bigger and bigger part of these maps. Uh, that would be my fantastic and amazing collaborators, Joshua Jelly Shapiro, uh, geographer from UC Berkeley. Um, but who spent a lot of his adult life in the Caribbean and is also a music historian, and our editor at large who contributed to both New Orleans and hugely to New York. Uh, the music, at, uh, would we call, uh, he's your friend too, would we call Garnett a music historian, a culture, I mean, he's a broader historian than that, but he's a great, great scholar of music and expert. And so Josh and Garnett have brought a lot of music into the last, and of course you can't do an Atlas of New Orleans without doing a huge amount of music. Although we tried not to do here was jazz born and do more complicated things about R and B and um, bounce and bounce and other kinds of music and same with New York City another important musical city and actually those two atlases have two maps that correspond one about the music that came from Africa and because we talk about what we talk about human beings being turned into commodities in the triangular slave trade. But we don't talk about the fact that they remained human beings and they brought culture with them. And that New Orleans is a place where that culture was not rubbed out for various reasons and became the font of all American music. And one of the things that was incredibly exciting to me is seeing that, you know, and that's a, you can trace hip hop and pretty much all, every other kind of music except maybe some Latin musics in, um, on the border on this country to New Orleans, is seeing hip hop has roots there too. And seeing that music with these that never stopped being African go back as part of the Arab Spring, which of course was the North African Spring really largely, was so amazing. So we have a map in the New Orleans Atlas about that, and then a more detailed map about how the Bronx, South Bronx was burning down as hip hop was rising up that I'd wanted to just see put together. And our research assistant, Jonathan Tarleton, did an amazing job on that. And it's one of those great conundrums. How could this incredibly important musical, political genre that's hip hop rise up in a community that was being destroyed so violently by landlord arson and disinvestment and dep deprivation of social services? Why is wealth often smothering culture into kind of, you know, some, some, somnolescent symphonic whatever? Why does sort of collision and crisis and desperation often breed incredible culture. And like, we don't have answers, but we have a great map of the Bronx. And oral <laughs> histories from Grandmaster, people who were working with Grandmaster Flash, with Fab, Fab Five Freddy, and some the book. others. What? Is that your first blurb from Fab Five Freddy? Yes, I have, I have like, I, I could die happy. I've been blurbed by Fab Five Freddy. <laughs> <laughs> Greater than which there is no blurb. <laughs> You were, you were just sort of edging into um, a, a kind of very neat capsule description of a paradise built in hell, which is about the generative commu communities which are born out of disaster, um, either natural or man-made or both. And I wonder if, you know, as, as you become the, a very de in-demand person, um, you're sort of like a... You mean the disaster of my life? <laughs> No, I think yeah. I think of you as like an em an empathic SWAT team that is often air <laughs> airdropped into disasters to to hurry up and tell us what it means and what it's going to create. And I and I you you write about that a bit in your introduction to this that one of the problems about um, the fact that your your way of seeing and writing about the world has an audience now is that you now have many more requests to do that in the way that you saw it before, which is at leisure, wandering off on a short notice to, for two weeks um, is no longer really a part of your life. And I, I guess this is a long-winded back word way of asking you, you, know, are you, do you ever worry that um, the, the framework in which political debate occurs now makes it very difficult for you to, to not make snap judgments about what is being created out of disasters? 
I, and there's two things there. I think that we're all, you know, social media, snap judgment culture, and it's interesting seeing people judge mothers whose children fell in gorilla pits and other things on with very sketchy and casual information. And, um, you know, and then there's also this kind of chatter sphere that we're all encouraged to, like, like young writers I know are all told that you must promote your work or you won't have a career. And it's like, yeah, but will you have work? Like, what are you, you know, you can't spend all your time promoting, you better spend some time creating. And it's one of the struggles, I think, that, uh, you know, if, you, if you're getting any, you know, I'm constantly being asked to do all these things I think of as, like, they have value, but they're on the surface to kind of blurb and be on, and speak and introduce and go uh, to conferences and things like that. And there's, there's like one person ever, like I can't even get my agent to do this. I've suggested she should. Nobody ever, or it's just like Solnit. Uh, there's so many great things happening out there. There's so many people who need things from you. There's so much, you know, like, like just like unplug everything and go home and think deep thoughts and don't come out till you have something. You know, like the, it really, it feels like it's the shallow end of the pool is where all the noise is. There's nobody saying like, like, ignore us, ignore it all, you know, like, go write your next book, go think deep thoughts, go do some really serious archival research, and that's, you know, go have a, ro a road trip and replenish, and I do, like, sneak off and get some of that stuff. But there are, but the demands are all kind of from the shallow end, and it's interesting, as the demands get louder and, more, you know, for more people, I, I feel like I have to, I'm still learning to build better barriers to, you know, kind of wall in some space to still be a writer. And I always think about that there must be somebody who wrote a book and got some attention for it and then was asked to do all these things who looks up 10 years later and realizes that they never wrote anything else of substance because they're off in that kind of gregarious, busy, buzzy sphere. Mm. So. So I think the length of my question obscured its, imp yeah. <laughs> its, its actual question. Which is the disaster part? <laughs> well, or? no, I think that because the, the, the news cycle moves so quickly, yeah. if you're going to comment on something when you have a, a comment of, of depth rather than just a, a, you know, um, a superficial opinion, it still means you have to comment within that cycle often to get it wedged into the debate. Or do you disagree with that, feel that I don't feel that much. I mean, you know, like, patriarchy is not a, you know, unfortunately, it, you know, didn't start yesterday and isn't going to go away tomorrow, although we're trying. And, um, you know, so, like, the feminist stuff, like, I'm, I want to, when I go, like, today or, t well, I don't have any time today. Tomorrow I might write a piece about, like, this week in violence against women. And it's not because this is Violence Against Women Awareness Week or something, just because, as usual, there's a huge amount of violence against women, murders, rapes, um, et cetera. And as usual, it's not treated as a crisis or a problem or even as a news story because there's a pattern. It's just like a few isolated minor things. And it's like that's, you know, like, you know, misogyny is perennial, so, so is feminist critique of it. Hmm. So, and then a lot of other stuff. Like, I've been thinking about writing about presidential elections as uh, disaster movies. <laughs> and um, I hate them so much. I'm so happy that after Tuesday, we'll almost be out of primary season. Um, it's been so ugly and stupid. The exciting combination of rage and, um, you know, ignorance has really made it quite a spring. And, um, but disaster movies, because, and it, you know, and it's sort of like the last six presidential elections, particularly since 2000, where I'm disaster, I hate to, I watched, when I wrote A Paradise Built in Hell, my book about disasters, which is really about the fact that a civil society rises up out of um, sort of natural and unnatural disasters, wars, and as well as revolutions. That's quite extraordinary. And that really requires us to rethink human nature, to re recognize that it's not, you know, rugged male leaders, cowboys, Charlton Heston, Tom uh, Cruise figures. It's all of us who actually, you know, save the victims, change the world, et cetera. And, what, and you know, I spent a lot of time talking with people who are in 9-11, who are in Hurricane Katrina, uh, who are in the Mexico City earthquake and other disasters and things like that. And the hardest thing I had to do to write that book is watch a bunch of disaster movies because they're just so offensive. They're deeply gendered. Um, they're usually racist, and they suggest most of us are stupid, 
well, women are basically hysterical, needing to be rescued, and helpless, needing to be rescued. Men, you guys are mostly rapists and looters. And um, except for that, that the sort of ubermensch who rises above. And the presidential elections are a narrative like that, where like one man will save us, and we'll get him in power, and then we'll all go home like we did after Obama got elected, and he'll magically make everything beautiful, and he doesn't. We'll stay home, but we'll simmer with resentment. <laughs> And it's, it's it's this incredible narrative that discounts pop, the huge role of civil society, popular power, uh, direct action, non-electoral politics, and et cetera. And it's just really, you know, excruciating. Mm. You um, so you, like that essay will probably be you know. You'll it, probably read it by the end of this week. Yeah. <laughs> but how many yeah, Re Rebecca Solnits are there site, working at? Uh, how many Rebecca Solnits are there working at your house? <laughs> You know, I used to politely decline things, saying if there were six of me, one of them would love to take on this project, but there's only one and she's overloaded. I know Garnett spreads rumors that I'm multiple, but I'm not, you know. Well, I worked on a piece by you, and in the gap of me replying, saying maybe we should think about this, you sent two perfectly crafted paragraphs, and I timed it, and it was 43 seconds. <laughs> Which one was that? This, was that... Is, I, this is at the end of the year when we were making an, a, an adjustment to um, uh, Men Explain Alita to Me. Oh, yeah. Which is a wonderful piece that she wrote in response to the response she got uh, responding to a piece, <laughs> still with me, uh, which was recommending um, 80 books you should read and 79 were by men and one which had a woman in it, had a woman being shot in the face. Yeah, and, and this was this Esquire thing called Every Book, 80 Books Every Man Should Read, with literature as a kind of aid in making you um, a dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is not the highest and best use of literature. Yeah, and, and she wrote a brilliant piece in response to that, which... Um, On his fantastic site, LitHub, you should all take a look at. Oh, it, it, was, it actually made LitHub because it was read 500,000 times. And then... What? It was, the, it was... Nobody ever tells the writer anything. I thought it was yeah. only 100,000. Okay, I'll no. take half a million, I'll take it. No, actually, uh, we, we have the traffic from that month, and it's like 1.2 million. <laughs> And it was, uh, but anyway, um, that response came back so quickly, I thought, one question, because I'm sure some of you out, out there are, are writers, is, uh, and I, I mean this admirably, is writing easy for you? It's the only thing that is. So, and, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, it feels like what I was born to do, so I keep doing it, and it's good that I can and that people seem to want to publish it and pay me for it, because at this point, there's nothing else I really can do. <laughs> so, you know, I actually really like doing it. Administrating and all that other stuff, I'm not so big on, and, you know, and um, my house could really use cleaning, but I actually really like <laughs> writing. And some stuff, and sometimes it's really, sometimes there's, I get stuck and there are things that are difficult and that don't turn out the way I want, and sometimes it feels laborious, and of course, I try not to make it, spend too much time thinking about myself, because then when you think about, is this good, is this not good, what will people think, then you get mm. stuck in the, the kind of ego zone of misery. But also, I get inspired, and unfortunately, you know, people think inspiration is about like the beautiful muse that inspires you to write a sonnet, but it's often the kind of incredibly nasty thing that inspires me to write a tirade, you know, like that Esquire thing, which was just so funny. John actually posted on Facebook the source of some, some of my most unpleasant inspirations. Um, this, uh, with, a, with a comment, this uh, 80 books every man should read, and I started riffing on it, and uh, by the second comment, I'd come up with 80 books no woman should read, thinking about just, Instructions by people like Ernest Hemingway and Jack Kerouac, why men are the center of the universe and women are dirt and utensils. And, um, you know, and then I like deleted the comments because I was like, I don't want to comment. I want to write an essay. And it wrote itself. So, yeah. But, that's, that's, but often when something seems like it writes itself, like I wrote Men Explain Things um, before, which must have several million hits in various places by now. Wrote it before breakfast when a friend told me to. But you know, my entire life had been in, uh, had been uh, you know raw material for that essay. I'd been waiting waiting more than forty years to write it. And one of the joys of my life now is my you know I 
I live a life of revenge on patriarchy, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> With John's help at Lit Hub, where we've done a bunch of great feminist stuff. Uh, it's, it's been fun. Uh, you, you have this wonderful line in that, and men explain things to me that you serve the essay to your friend with breakfast? Yeah, yeah, my wonder, Marina Citrin, what a great public intellectual and political theorist, and one of, my, one of my closest friends was staying with me. And the night before, I'd been joking for years about writing an essay called Men Explain Things to Me because men explain things to me. <laughs> and when I had the famous incident where the man explained about the very important Moybridge book I should read without bothering to find out that I'd actually written it, <laughs> You know, that was, that was kind of the clinching anecdote. Although I've heard from so many women, I, there probably isn't any woman in here who doesn't have an anecdote, you know, along, or several thousand along those lines. And Marina said, you need to write it because young women like my sister need to read it to know that it's not them, it's patriarchy. And, um, you know, that this is not happening to them because they're actually dumb and naive. It's uh, unqualified in their, you know, and this is about doc women doctors getting medicine explained to them by guys who don't know anything about medicine, women engineers getting engineering explained to them, women astrophysicists, I know people in all these categories, getting astrophysics explained to them, et cetera, by guys who don't actually know what they're talking about um, with, you know, some bad theory about where knowledge is located in human anatomy. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and so like, you know, and it was actually kind of shocking to me because I thought I was writing a funny essay because the opening anecdote is really funny. It's about a guy explaining my own book to me who's like too much of a blowhard to notice that he's talking to the author. And, um, and it was interesting realizing that this is, you know, the more microaggressions was not in circulation much then, but that this is a slippery slope that it's about who has credibility and who has the right to speak. And, you know, there's this incredible piece that came out yesterday on BuzzFeed, the letter from a rape victim raped by a Stanford swimmer. It sounds like a lot of you have read, and it's about the way she's sort of abused in court. Credibility is a basic survival skill. If you need to have the um, as much right to be believed as everybody else, you need to be heard, you need to not be silenced, you need to not be dismissed, you need to not be, you know. And so and it ended up being about you know, women being raped and murdered to silence them. It ended up being serious work. So mm. how did I get on that? Jolly, jolly patriarchy. <laughs> well, let me ask one, one, one more question, and then I'm sure you have many questions for Rebecca, but... Um, but we have no time. We got our five minutes. <laughs> no, that's five minutes until this question Oh, right, started. then there's Q&A period. Yeah. The writer is always the last to know. <laughs> so. Well, uh, the, the one thing as a teller of other people's stories, um, what you described just then is, reminds me that, that dignity is an essential part of storytelling, that you know, the, the dignity of the teller is, and if you take the story away from someone, you're, you're, you're basically stealing their dignity. And at the same time, you, you as a journalist and a thinker and, a, and, a, and an activist, you have to break stories. You have to break stories in order to, to sort of find a way towards the, the story that is perhaps the truth or the, the more complicated and enlarging story. How do you balance those two things? It's so great to hear the word dignity, which is huge in, this, in Mexico and the Spanish-speaking world. And the Zapatistas talk about dignidad a lot. And yeah, you know, I was tr I'm so happy I was trained as a journalist and not in creative nonfiction, which sometimes gets a little bit too creative with the nonfictional aspects. And, with journal and, you know, and I gave the commencement address that became an essay you can find at LitHub. We're now embarked on a great collaboration called Break the Story. And, um, you know, I think that, you, you know, I, I feel really close to photographers who I work with all my adult life in that you don't Photoshop people in and out of your picture. You work with what's, you know, you, if you're a good photographer, you can work with what's there without distorting it. And you can respect other people's story while telling, while telling that story. You don't have to distort it. And you can serve, you know, and it's not everybody. I, and I write, you, you don't have to serve Donald Trump by writing about Donald Trump. But when you write about anonymous people, victims, um, people whose stories haven't been told before, the first obligation you have is to get it right because the lack of respect in distorting the truth about somebody is just huge and gross and immoral. And it often comes out of laziness, but there's an eth ethical mandate to get it right. And... Uh, that I think is a, is a beginning point. And, um, 
you know, and there are, and it's often, it's listening to, you know, I'll, and it's funny because I also grew up during a postmodern era that treated cameras as guns and treated being seen as being exploited. And that can be true of the way anthropologists and photographers have worked. But so many people want their story to be told. I and mean, so much of political activism and struggle, organizing, et cetera. And Black Lives Matter has been about making the murder of young, young, pe young and not young people of color like Eric Garner by the police visible and to make it felt and understood. You know, there's, and, you know, to not, to not be invited into the conversation, to be silenced, to be rendered invisible is so central to um, being destroyed politically, economically, socially. So the opposite, to be visible, to be audible, to participate. And it's complex when you're a medium for somebody else's story, but, you know, there's, this is something we could talk about for years, but, hmm. you know, there's an, I try and do a good job, and so far, the, you know, a lot of people have been, you know, I've, I seem to have gotten most things right, and people have been, uh, usually pretty graceful, gra graceful, and if not always grateful about being in the stories. So I have one minute. So, what story uh, among many is are you going to take like a pull cue and just crack over your knee in the next week or two? I mean, there's so many. I want to go after Silicon Valley some more because. The way that the Bay Area used to be, and California, I, we used to be the radical edge. It was kind of the alternative, the laboratory for difference. The fact that the Sierra Club was forced by, rent, by rising rents to leave San Francisco, the city which was created 124 years ago, and it moved to Oakland, which is fine, you know, and they did it in a way that was looked really hard at how to do it without just being gentrifying, displacing forces. You know, the Sierra Club is fine, but what does it mean that San Francisco has these incredibly destructive and exploitative things like Uber, which is coming up with new ways to make poor people go into debt peonage while working for uh, unlivable wages, you know, has basically replaced the Sierra Club in San Francisco. And, the, you know, and what does it mean that this place that used to be kind of an engine of alternatives is now one of the global power centers. I'm, uh, Wall Street on the east and Silicon Valley on the west are kind of like these, these twin Sauron towers now, <laughs> to go back to our Lord of the Rings stuff. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, and it's been Edward Snowden and from 2013 on, people have been a little bit critical about it. But what it's done locally, the incredible destructiveness of uh, communities and cultures, and what those, you know, the tendency of those organizations to break up com community, you know, and they get used in both ways. I mean, Mona here is one of the great users of Twitter. She says it saved her life. It was a big part of the Arab Spring, as was Facebook, but that's what people did with those tools. There's nothing about the people who own those tools that makes them, for example, stop um, the massive amounts of death threats feminists get via Twitter and uh, things like that. And um, This is why you're not on Twitter. Yeah, uh, the threat the threat factor is too high. Also, um, I'm distracted enough already. <laughs> so, and um, also, it's very hard for me to have a thought in 140 characters. I'm always wow. amused by Roxanne Gay, who sends out tweets ten at a time because she's like me. She's really a paragraph woman, not a sentence <laughs> woman. Well, thank you for your paragraphs, Rebecca Solnit. This has been a great privilege. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. Um, wow, right ahead. They're going to bring you a microphone. So, so nice David, to have the lights changed. That David's was really painful. David's coming with a microphone. <clears throat> uh, thank you for a great conversation. Um, so my question revolves around you know, how you mentioned that the Bay Area was an engine of the alternative, and a lot of it is knowing the history of the Bay Area. And, and, and in the US, there's so much movement all the time. People are moving from place to place. And especially in the Bay Area, we have so much diversity, people coming from all over the world. 
And so how do you help them know the sense of the place, to understand the problems of the place? Because you know, even the New York Times reported that in recently, in just a couple of years, there are 30,000 people that move from New York to San Francisco for jobs in technology. So when you come with a sense, okay, I'm coming to work in technology, that's all you know. You know they don't have the time or the energy to go and, uh, or even know the resources to go and learn more about or how they could help with you know, inequality or homelessness. And, and just to contrast, there are 22 billionaires alone in San Francisco with 6,000 homeless people. You know, it's, it's there, but nobody talks about it. So how do you, what do you think is the role of fiction or maybe even mediums such as film to kind of educate the population to help them feel you know, connected to a sense of place, which they don't right now because they're all in their own little communities and, and are not really connected to the Bay Area because you know, people come from all over. You know, at, um, that's a, a great question, and I don't know that I have an answer because first you have to recognize that it's important to actually know where you are and respect who was there before you. And secondly, you, you know, it's funny because we're always being told people don't have time, and it's like, okay, you know, it's like, okay, you, have you spend 10 hours, you know, it used to be people watch TV 20 hours a week while saying they didn't have time for anything. Now it's probably social media and, um, you know, and online life and stuff like that. And it's a, it's a value. And it's been one of the painful things I live on the edge of the mission, seeing a community that's particularly deeply rooted in culture, community, sense of place, identity, you know, with physical manifestations from, you know, churches to murals to the Galleria de la Raza and the Mission Cultural Center be replaced by what feels like a particularly, almost an anti-place culture where, like, you know, a culture that's, where people don't actually know where they're going because their phone will tell them so they never learn the lay of the land, who look, I know, you know, really perturbed if a stranger talks to them because you should go through six layers of social media before there's actual human contact. <laughs> And uh, there's a lot of, you know, and it's, and it's sort of like, how do we make their culture into a different culture is maybe the essence of your question. And like, you know, that's, you know, they have to decide what kind of culture they want. I'm just going to keep working for the kind of culture I believe in. That's all I can do. So which includes trying to write histories and support histories, which, uh, you know, and a sense of place and memory and and an understanding of what civil society is and community is and place can mean. So, and that's present in films and, and books of all kinds, in music and oral history. And it's something you learn, I think, but, and something I feel, one of the, uh, I quoted it last year in Harper's, uh, the activist Helena Norberg Hodge, who I think is trained as an anthropologist, once said the worst segregation in the United States is generational segregation. And part of what's weird about Silicon Valley is that it's sort of all transient young people. And one of the things that makes the Latino community strong, I think, is that there is a lot of intergenerationality, um, young people listening to older people, so that you, you, know, you can't pass things on without intergenerational um, serious time, respect, and affection uh, going in both directions. So speaking as somebody who's turning into an old person rapidly. <laughs> Young people, mark my words. <laughs> okay. I really enjoyed this morning's presentation. And uh, a couple days ago, I finished the book, Man Explains Things to Me, and I really enjoyed that book. Um, this morning, I finished Sebastian Younger's book, The Tribe, and he devoted an entire paragraph, uh, chapter to what you explained uh, about in your book about uh, paradise built in hell, yeah. people come together after disasters. Yeah. So I turned to the back of the book to see who was referenced. There's three men. You weren't there. It's, I, was, I was like amazed because your descriptions in the book were so much fuller and fleshed out, and he didn't even mention you. I and mean, he could have, you know, I, you know, some people think I invented disasters. Um, you know, I, I am myself sometimes a disaster, but it isn't so. And my work is based partly on action, you know, on firsthand conversation. But what really got me going was these incredible disaster sociologists. I tried to highlight people like Charles Fritz, uh, Kathleen Tierney, um, 
Lee Clark at Rutgers and stuff. And like my work is based on their work. Um, some of them are female, it's true. So I haven't looked at his book, so I can't comment on it. But, um, you know, I didn't originate those ideas. I just tried to bring them out of the little scene world of disaster sociology into the public eye. And I'd found them also just in reading oral histories. It really began for me, well, first living through the 89 earthquake here, and then reading oral histories of the 1906 earthquake, which were just extraordinary for the incredible hate of authorities who were behaving very violently and badly, the, uh, the city government and the federal government in form, the form of the US military that was essentially a hostile occupying army, and also, singing, and also describing the way civil society, as it so often does, was doing the rescuing, the building of communities and soup kitchens and um, you know, taking care of itself uh, incredibly beautifully as it, you know, so who knows? I haven't looked at the book. I may never. <laughs> so many books. So other questions? So I was wondering, um, the way you approach myriad subjects seems very authoritative, and you don't seem, you present an idea very boldly without second guessing yourself, which I think is the way most men are able to present ideas as well. Um, so I'm wondering how, what advice you have especially for younger women to cultivate that authority and that sort of unflinchingness in their own opinions and ideas. It's funny, sometimes I, well, one of the, one of the things I hate about writers in movies is all they ever do is type, which is about 3% of writing. It's the, the other 97% is all the thinking before and all the revising and rethinking and uh, afterwards, and then there's a research rule. I often go into my pieces and take out all the I think or may, and maybes and, and in, you know the kind of in my opinion qualifiers to just say that like you know and that's because there's a way women are trained to talk where where that's very self-effacing and when it's down on the page you can erase that and that's one thing the other thing is you know you have to go out on a limb and you know if you're going to write you're you're taking chances you might as well take them boldly and you know and do it as well as you can by doing your research and covering the ground to get your facts right and um, try and get your logic right if you're making an argument. But, you know, you, you just have to, you have to take those risks. So, and most people survive. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's also because we spend so much time, you know, like... <laughs> You know, I asked my ne somebody's been trying to get my nephew to get on a boat, and he was five at the time. And I was like, why, do, uh, why don't you like so and so? And it's like, because he keeps trying to make me get on the boat. And I'm like, what will happen if you get on the boat? And he just looked at me and said, I'll die. <laughs> and then we we have this lurking fear that we're going to die if people attack, make fun of us, if we get something wrong, if you know the first publisher rejects us, if we get a bad review. And then, like, at a, if you've been doing this for a while, all those things have happened to you, and, you know, you're still among the living. So, like, you know, do it anyway is kind of one of my mottos. Malcolm, do you have a, do you have a question? Tell me a story. <laughs> I mean, I've told you enough stories. No, you haven't. <laughs> let's, let, but we'll get to that later. Let's have lunch. <laughs> yes, so, please. listen, I, as I'm listening to you talk about the necessity of telling the truth, I'm reminded of that wonderful statement by Lars Eric Nelson that the enemy is not liberalism, the enemy is not conservatism, the enemy is bullshit. <laughs> 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 and to what extent does this come from your journalism training? Yeah. yeah you I mean, think it does. You, you mean you, my. Yeah, I am just so, you know, I gave the commencement address at uh, the J School, the journalism school at Berkeley a couple weeks ago, which is now at uh, the Break the Story piece at LitHub. And I'm just so grateful I got that education, which is about being resourceful, about getting it right, and about responsibility. Maybe those are three R's I just made up, but. Uh, okay. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting, because I think that actually the main, what, a lot of the media gets accused of having a left-wing or a right-wing bias. I think they often have a status quo bias, which is that the way things are is immutable, unexaminable, um, the way they're supposed to be. You know, it's to sort of not ask the deeper questions about, like, why do we 
you know, and one of the things I did, talked about in the, in the Break the Story thing is, you know, there's this obsession with women lying about rape. I'm actually one of the few people who's actually looked into the statistics. Um, it's incredibly low, and lying about rape doesn't mean accusing somebody of raping you who didn't rape you. That's a whole different, you know, or it's often somebody who, like, well, it's a long story. It's a very minor problem. You know who totally lies about rape and, um, is rapists. <laughs> and, like, they just don't show up in court and say, yeah, I totally raped that child. You know, ask a Catholic priest. And, um, you know, so it's really about learning. And this is where I think, you know, some, some Zen, some Native American stories, a lot of Talmudic bad attitude, you know, has, is really important to just sort of like help ask better questions. That might have been an answer to a question you, that you didn't ask. <laughs> but, you know. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I have to break us for time there, but there are a million good questions to ask yourself in all the books, which will be outside, I hope. Um, Rebecca will sign them. Thank you very much for coming.